taking her out and there'll just be a few friends. <laughs> so you'll have to bear with me because I want to give a little token of my esteem and love to my Valentine, Kelly Ashby Paul. Please come forward. Does anybody think that, that we can project power 
from bankruptcy court? <laughs> That's what they said. Oh, we're sending it to these countries to project power. Do you know a good example of projecting power? Hillary Clinton's war in Libya. Didn't go so well. Hillary thought it would be a great idea to go to Libya and topple the government there. Well, you know what we have now? We have a jihadist wonderland. Jihadists roam the countryside. In fact, jihadists swim in our embassy swimming pool in Tripoli. It's an utter disaster. It's a disaster and a disgrace. The same people who were foretoppling Gaddafi, some of them my colleagues in the Senate, were in Libya the year before trying to give arms and money to Gaddafi. A year later, therefore, the freedom fighters in Libya. Many of the freedom fighters we actually had in prison at one time. Some of them in Guantanamo Bay, some of them in other prisons, some of them associated with Al-Qaeda. Now people call them freedom fighters in Libya. They're jihadists. They're people who hate America. We are less safe because of that war in Libya. There were 15,000 surface-to-air missiles in Libya. Gone. Unaccounted for. Where are they? In Syria. They asked your Congress to send weapons into Syria a year and a half ago, two years ago, to send to the moderate rebels there, the moderate Islamic rebels. I, I listened to a CIA analyst talking about this about a month ago, and he said, you know, the only thing moderate about those rebels is their ability to fight. <laughs> those weapons have been a pit stop for ISIS. And so when I voted against sending weapons into Syria, I said the irony, the great irony is that we'll be back. Either us or Israel will have to fight against American weapons that we sent into a war that makes no sense. There are two million Christians in Syria. Two million Christians. More Christians in Syria than any other place in the Middle East other than Egypt. Two million Christians and they're caught in the middle of a war. But if you ask them, who would you rather govern you, Assad or ISIS? Nobody wants ISIS. This is the side that our weapons were going to. Now they will say we didn't give them to ISIS, but we created a safe haven for ISIS. We supported allies of ISIS. ISIS grew exponentially stronger and stronger until they now are a threat. We have to think before we act. I'm a physician. Part of the Hippocratic Oath is, first, do no harm. Think through the consequences of our action before we act. I think we do have to do something about ISIS now. I think the quagmire of the Middle East is something I don't want to get back involved with, but it's a thousand-year war. Sunnis and Shia have been fighting each other for a thousand years. But now they are a threat to our embassy in Baghdad. They're a threat to our consulate in, in, in Erbil. So something has to be done. But the things we did in advance of that have made it worse for us. Think about Libya. Libya actually, through Gaddafi, gave up their nuclear ambitions. They traded them in. What happened to them? We toppled them anyway. What kind of message do you think this has sent to Iran? We're trying to get Iran to negotiate away their nuclear ambitions, and yet they see Libya. So we sent the wrong signal. Hillary's war in Libya is a disaster at every level you can think of. And then in the aftermath of the war, when Hillary was asked to protect the embassy, she looked the other way. They were asked for security. They pled for security time and time again. Special forces were taken out in February. And then special forces were taken out again in March. Then in April, they asked for a plane, a DC-3, a 50-year-old plane, just in case of emergency. Hillary Clinton denied every request. They were embarrassed of our soldiers having weapons. They were embarrassed of our soldiers even wearing their military boots. They told them not to wear their boots, not to show their weapons, because we wanted to be politically correct. We wanted the State Department, Hillary Clinton's State Department, just didn't want to show anybody that we need to have any weapons over there. And as a consequence, we lost our ambassador. Three days after Hillary Clinton's State Department turned down the plane, that they wanted to be able to fly around the country or flee if they had to, three days later, Hillary Clinton approved $100,000 for a charging station, for a Chevy Volt charging station in Vienna for the ambassador. The ambassador was greening up the embassy. Wanted to show how green he was. We paid $100,000 for a charging station, but we couldn't supply a plane. 
When it gets to the middle of August, Ambassador Stevens is sending cable after cable pleading that they are under direct attack, they are under danger of being overrun. So when Hillary Clinton came before my committee, I asked her the question, did you read the cables? And she acted a little put off. She acted as if, who, me? I'm a little too important to be reading the cables. The question is, what countries are more dangerous or were more dangerous at that time? Libya had to be one of the five most dangerous countries in the world, and she didn't seem to have time to read the cables. Colonel Wood was in charge of the 16-man security team, the final sort of team that could have kept some security over there. He requested to stay. The ambassador sent cables requesting to stay, and Hillary Clinton said, we're not going to leave them there. We don't want to appear as if we have to have weapons to be in charge. Guns are sort of bad. We don't want to show our guns to the Libyans. Throughout this summer, though, Hillary Clinton had other requests for money. So don't let her stand up and say, oh, we didn't have enough money. Republicans wouldn't give us enough money. Over the summer, she spent $100,000 sending three comedians to India on the Make Chai Not War Tour. That was really effective. <laughs> she spent $5 million on crystal glass and barware for the embassy. $5 million. Not enough money for a DC-3 for Libya. $5 million she spent on crystal glassware. Then she thought they needed more Facebook friends. So she spent $650,000 on Facebook ads to get more Facebook friends for the State Department. But when I asked her whether she read the cables, she didn't seem to have time. I say that Hillary Clinton, by her dereliction of duty, by not providing security, by not doing what she was should have done, should forever prevent herself from being considered for the presidency. have given up on so many people, young people, minorities, people who live in cities, poor people, working class people. We need to go where we're not going. We need to boldly go where we haven't gone. I've spent the last two years showing up at places no Republican has gone in decades. I've gone to the Urban League. I meet with the NAACP. I meet with kids. I go to universities. I went to Berkeley. <laughs> But I take the same message to the Conservative Political Action Committee that I took to Berkeley. And we got a standing ovation in both places. Because it's a defense of liberty. It's a defense of privacy. It's the belief that, you know what? We all like the Second Amendment. You can't keep the Second Amendment. You can't keep your right to bear arms if you don't protect the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment and the Fifth Amendment. absolutely no reason for the government to ever look at your phone records without a warrant. It's not a very business. Some people say, oh, these business records, those are just your boring old business records. You're talking about your visa. Why not let the government, if, if, the new standard is, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. That standard is a little bit of a diminishment of innocence until proven guilty. <laughs> Think about your visa records. Give me your visa records and I can tell whether you drink, whether you smoke, whether you gamble, whether you read Reason Magazine. <laughs> I can tell who you are. I can tell who your doctors are. I can tell who your medications are. I can tell a lot about your individual personal life that is of no business to the government. Two Stanford students put apps on kids' phones voluntarily to see what they could determine. 85% of the time they could tell your religion. 
Most of the time they could tell who your doctors were. They could tell who your lawyer was, your accountant. They could tell all of this personal behavior. The question is, can we have liberty and security? I think we can. I think there's absolutely no reason we have to give up our liberty to stop terrorism, to keep our security. Not only can big government not run the post office, they've messed up other things as well. And some of these things have had profound effects on people who may not have been open to the Republican Party before. The criminal justice system has been taken by big government and justice has been turned on its head. I'll give you an example. Civil forfeiture, the government can take your stuff without ever charging you or convicting you. It's the opposite. You are guilty until you prove yourself innocent. The Washington Post has looked at this over the last six months to a year in the, in the newspaper. Hundreds and hundreds of cases of people who had their stuff taken. Guess who they were? African Americans, Hispanics, poor people, working class white folks, people who don't have the ability or the resources to get their money back. If the government takes $1,500, anybody here think you can get an attorney, go to court to get your 1500 bucks back and have any money left over? No. No. If we take our suspicion that big government's not very good at things, if we take our belief in the Second Amendment and the Bill of Rights, if we take that belief and apply it to other people who in their lives are seeing the Bill of Rights not covered, due process not covered, to poor people, to working class people, frankly to people in our major cities who have never ever thought about voting for a Republican, I think we take that. We take that passionate message of the Bill of Rights to people who haven't heard it, not diluting the message one iota, but taking the message that we believe in, showing up and telling people that we care about them, where they live, and how government interacts with them, I think there is no end, no top side. There is no limit to what we can do as a party, and I want to be part of that, and I hope you do too. As we take our message forward, as we spread our message around the country, we need to take it with optimism. We need to take it with that we are the party that is bringing you an opportunity. We're not the party that wants to punish anybody. I want everybody in this country to have a job. Absolutely everyone in this country to work. Not as punishment, not as punishment, but as reward. Many writers have talked about this. We live in this age of self-esteem. Everybody wants some self-esteem. Here's some self-esteem. The only self-esteem that actually counts and works is earned self-esteem. You get it to work, and I want everybody to work. I see no reason that every able-bodied person in this country shouldn't work. If you have to be temporarily on assistance, work should be associated with it. Without exception, if you are able-bodied, you should work. As we take our message forward, as we spread this message across the country, I like the image of uh, that a painter by the name of Robert Henry spoke of. He said to young painters, he said, paint like a man coming over the hill singing. I love the image of that. I think if we take our message forth with the passion of Patrick Henry, but we proclaim our message like a man coming over the hill singing with great optimism, with great hope, and with great understanding that there is great potential in every human being, I think we'll be the dominant party again. Thank you very much.